Welcome to Miracles in the Book of Acts with Dr. Peter McLuhan. Our topic today is Miracles in Athens. In last week's program, we learned how Paul and Silas brought the gospel to Berea. Luke described the Bereans as more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scripture daily to find out whether these things were so. Acts 17, verse 11. This means that the Jewish community in Berea wanted Paul to show them from the Old Testament that Jesus was the promised Messiah. They saw for themselves that Jesus fulfilled the prophetic promises of the prophets, and they received him as their Messiah. Luke reported that many of them believed along with many of the prominent Greek women and men. In typical fashion, religious leaders from Thessalonica, the previous city Paul had visited, came to Berea to turn people away from the message Paul preached. We learned that Paul left Berea at night and found a ship sailing for Athens the next morning. And this is the first time that Paul enters a major city without his traveling companions. We read that as Paul entered Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols, Acts chapter 17 and verse 16. Luke tells us that Paul reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplaces every day with those who happened to be there, Acts 17 verse 17. Soon Paul got into intellectual conversations with Epicureans and Stoic philosophers. It is out of these two schools of thinking that rabbinic Judaism was established as a system by the Pharisees and the Sadducees who ruled the temple in Jerusalem in the time of Jesus. Paul was very familiar with these groups because he was a Pharisee. Both the Epicureans and the Sadducees did not believe in life after death. And when Paul spoke about the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, they were very skeptical about his teaching. Nevertheless, they wanted Paul to present his case for the resurrection of Jesus before their supreme court. This group was referred to as the Areopagus, or simply as Mars Hill. The message that Paul preached on Mars Hill is sometimes referred to as one of the boldest messages Paul ever preached. And now there's no question that there was a risk in speaking to this group. They were the same people who sentenced Socrates to death. Luke noted that all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time doing nothing except telling and hearing about something new. Acts 17, verse 21. And Paul began his speech by saying, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious, for as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, what therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. Acts chapter 17, verse 22 and 23. In those days... A priest would release a goat to walk about wherever it wanted to go in the city, in the marketplace. He would follow the animal. And when the animal became tired and laid down to rest, the priest would kill it right there and sacrifice that animal to what they called an unknown God. And Paul's point is that Jesus was the unknown God who walked among the people, who laid down his life willingly for the sins of all, Then Paul went on to say, The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and the earth, does not live in temples made by men, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all men life and breath and everything. Acts 17, verse 24 and 25. Paul made this bold statement within the sight of the most important temple the Greeks had ever built. 
The Parthenon was one of the first buildings constructed out of pure marble. In fact, the roof tiles were so pure that the sunlight could shine right through the tiles and light the inside of the building where the god was kept. They referred to that portion as the naos of the temple. After 2,500 years, the Parthenon still stands as one of the great buildings of antiquity. I visited the Parthenon many times, and it was and still is a marvel to human engineering. The philosophers must have been shocked to hear Paul say that God does not live in buildings built with human hands. And if that were not bold enough, Paul went on to say, God made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of all the earth, having determined their allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling places, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him, Yet he is actually not very far from each one of us. Acts chapter 17, verse 26 and 27. This is a truth that Paul had to discover for himself. God was nearer to him than he thought, and all he needed to do was to recognize who Jesus is. This is the truth that I share with you in these messages, that God is nearer to you than you think. Ask God to open your eyes to see who Jesus really is. Paul continued saying that Jesus is not like statues of gold and silver and stone that are inside their temples. He said we ought not to think of the divine being like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. Acts 17 verse 29, I visited temples around the world that have an amazing imagination of man's, mind, of man's thinking to make these objects that they believe are representative of their gods. The lifeless goddess Athena was made out of 400 pounds of pure gold, and yet she could not breathe, could not see, and could not hear. Paul declared that Jesus is alive. He said, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance, But now he commands all people everywhere to repent, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof to all men by raising Jesus from the dead. Acts 17, verse 30 and 31. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again. Acts chapter 17, verse 32. Now, after saying these things, Paul's meeting with the philosophers ended. It is a miracle that he was not attacked by that group. And Paul reports that some men joined him and believed, and amongst them were Diocenes the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. Acts 17, verse 31. Now, this is the smallest response Paul ever had to the message he preached. Now, we can be sure there's more to the story than Luke recorded, but we do know that eventually Greece became an important center for Christianity. It remains so to this very day. We don't know if Paul ever spoke before the Areopagus again or not. It appears that he was not attacked by any religious leaders, and he left the city of Athens peacefully, on his own, and traveled on to the city of Corinth. Now, scholars are divided about the effectiveness of Paul's ministry in Athens. There's no mention of a church being established, nor did Paul write a letter to the followers of Jesus in Athens. Uh, Several years ago, I was invited to give a lecture on the journeys of Paul. The title of these lectures was called 80 Kilometers to Corinth. I propose that as Paul traveled from Athens to Corinth, he had a long time to reflect on the effectiveness of his ministry in Athens. As a Pharisee and highly educated person, I suggested that Paul would have been the most comfortable in Athens and the least comfortable in the sinful city of Corinth. It seems to me that as Paul walked to Corinth, Holy Spirit reminded him how Jesus attracted people to his message. 
Jesus drew people to himself, not with clever arguments, but with demonstrations of the power of God through healing people of all kinds of diseases. Paul reaped little fruit in Athens compared to the massive harvest that he reaped in Corinth. This points out that defending our faith intellectually is not as important as demonstrating the power of our faith through lives being changed and people being healed. It's possible that this shift in approach is found in some of the statements that Paul made to the Corinthian believers himself. He said, I decided to know nothing amongst you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. My speech and my message were not in plausible words of human wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith might not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 2 through 5. Or well, think about these words that Paul said to the Corinthians. I will come to you soon, and I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 19 and 20. So Paul must have realized that he needed to get back to the basics of healing people and preaching the simple message of Jesus. From here on, Paul's ministry was marked by releasing the power of Jesus to heal. It became much more prominent, took a much more prominent place in his ministry. I've had the privilege of preaching in Athens on several occasions. And recently I preached in the Iranian church in downtown Athens. We released the power of Jesus to heal before we preached the message that Jesus brought. A lady with back pain was healed. Many people were healed in that conference. Uh, before that, Pastor Margaret and I ministered at a refugee center in Athens helping Afghans and Iranians. An Afghan lady came to the center who needed heart bypass surgery. She was constantly out of breath, and after we prayed for her, her heart was healed. I feel an anointing on me right now to pray for people to be healed. If, like this Afghan lady, you need bypass surgery, you can't afford it, and nobody is willing to help you, I'm going to help you by the power of Jesus right now. I say to your heart right now, be healed in Jesus' name. I command your arteries to be unclogged so that your blood can flow freely through your heart and give you the strength and energy that you need. I command normal breathing to be restored to you. Oh, what a great thing it is when God heals people. We've had a number of people who've had their hearts healed by the power of Jesus. You will know if you've just been touched, you'll be able to walk stairs. In the case of this Afghan lady, she couldn't even carry her baby up the stairs, but her, her children, younger children, had to help her. And she went home that night and carried her baby and the pram all the way up the stairs. She knew she had been healed. When Paul was in Athens, he spoke about the resurrection of the dead. The philosophers laughed at him. While I was in Athens, a young lady in Iran passed by a construction site and uh, was hit in the head by some falling bricks, a terrible accident. She was taken to the hospital in critical condition. My friend came looking for me. He was at the refugee center, and he said, Would you pray with me for this lady that Jesus will save her life? That night, her father was called. We invited him to ask Jesus to heal his daughter. And when he went to the hospital the next day, he found that she had died. He was frantic. He laid on her and commanded her in the name of Jesus, by the power of Jesus, to come back to life. And she did. And the entire family who belonged to another religion became followers of Jesus. Paul said, it's time to repent because God has fixed a day to judge the world. I invite you to receive Jesus as your Savior. Say with me, thank you, Jesus, for laying down your life for me on the cross so that I can be forgiven for the sins that I have committed. You don't need an intellectual argument. You just need Jesus. Holy Spirit, fill me with your presence. Say that with me. Holy Spirit, if you prayed with me, 
Holy Spirit, fill me with your presence. Oh, feel the Spirit of God coming upon you. You might even be given a strange language to speak. It's a language to talk to God. You just prayed with me? Write to me, and I will share more information with you on how to grow in your faith. Next week, we'll continue studying miracles in the book of Acts. We hope this message has filled you with living hope in Jesus. If you would like to talk with someone about your spiritual journey, please leave a comment or send us a private message. We enjoy reading your notes and having an opportunity to pray with you. If you received a blessing through this message, please share it with others. We invite you to become a Living Hope Partner by donating as little as $1 a month through our QR code. Your gifts will help us create new messages and reach more people. Living Hope is a ministry of Ingleside International Incorporated. All donations to Living Hope qualify as a charitable contribution. Thank you for your prayers and support. Next week, we will continue learning together from the Word of God. God bless you and fill you with living hope.